Some killers attack complete strangers. Some target the vulnerable, the young or the elderly. And some prey on people that they know. There are killers who are inspired by money or by revenge, by sexual deviancy, by hatred. There are opportunists and there are meticulous planners. But what unites these men and women is one simple trait. And it's the most terrifying thing of all. They live amongst us. In our towns, on our streets, in our houses. They're just like the rest of us, but capable of evil. And they could be anywhere. Welcome to Murder Town. Do you feel it in the air? Oh. Tonight's episode explores two horrifying murders in the northern city of Hull. It's an industrial city on the banks of the River Humber. In modern times, it's a city of culture. But back in 1984, the city was harboring a grim secret. This was an incredibly complicated case that had been going on a very long time. Things just didn't add up. There was just too many unanswered questions, really. They had, I think, four or five suspects, but they weren't sure which one had done it. He was going to play the long game in this, and he was determined at the outset to try and make sure that he got away with murder. On the 9th of March, 1984, uh, nine-year-old Christopher Laverack was staying uh, with his auntie and uncle at a house in Harpham Grove in, in East Hull. His auntie, who was looking after him at the time, had gone to work as a barmaid at a local pub, and she would later be joined that night by her uncle, who was also looking after Christopher. When the uncle returned two hours or so later, there appeared to have been a burglary at the house. Some plants had been tipped out of the, the baskets. Uh, a TV had purportedly been stolen. There were signs of a disturbance in the lounge. And the little nine-year-old boy uh, had gone. Home alone for two hours, nine-year-old Christopher Laverack had now vanished and the place he was staying in had been turned upside down. Was this simply a burglary or something more sinister? It was every parent's worst nightmare. The police were called, there was uh, initial investigations done, there were inquiries done far and wide in relation to trying to trace uh, both Christopher and the outcome of what had happened to him. Remember, this was 1984, so this is before widespread CCTV. It's before we had number plate recognition cameras, before social media, before mobile phones. So detectives had to scour the city, speaking to locals and identifying possible suspects. And they relied on the community to come forward with information. To reach them, they asked journalists to make appeals in the local newspaper. when somebody is missing, when somebody has, uh, has been abducted, when there is some element of foul play, uh, a newspaper is, is very important to that investigation, to, to raise public awareness, to uh, help with appeals, to look for witnesses, to be the, the, the public's face. 
when Christopher first went missing, literally all that the police could do was put out a missing persons appeal. Uh, the newspapers, the local radio, local TV did their best uh, to, to raise awareness, but in an age before social media and the internet, it was really much down uh, to, to, to good solid police work. It must have been a very, very difficult time to be a police officer, and certainly an almost impossible time to be a journalist. It wasn't until the 11th of March, some two days later, when a man was walking his dog in, in Beverly Beck, that uh, he found Christopher's body floating in a, uh, a tread air carpet bag in, in the Beck, having been horrifically murdered. police now find themselves in a situation where everybody is a suspect. Justice is the most important thing. People started to offer their own little explanations as to what they thought might have happened, um, what they thought about various family members, various neighbours, and uh, when it became a murder, uh, that became doubly so. Uh, people now genuinely wanted to do whatever they could to make sure that, uh, that, that justice caught up with whoever had done this. Inquiries into Christopher's death continued at a great pace. Hundreds of detectives were, worked on the case. Thousands and thousands of statements were taken, but many, many leads were followed over many, many years. And they all turned to nothing, ultimately. Police were baffled. Several local suspects remained on their radar including known sex offenders, but none could be tied to the crime. There were no more clues, no forensic evidence that could be unpicked, and no charges. There was no obvious motive to this, and certainly it, you know, the interest in this, in this particular case, and the fear to some extent in the communities, gripped the city for, for years. This became one of the best known cases, I think, in, uh, in, in the city of Hull ever. Everyone you spoke to, about this case in the, in the city of Hull would already know about it or have heard about it. Although the case was never closed, the investigation ceased until new evidence could come to light. And Hull would live on with a murderer in its midst. That was until 2005, when another crime would once again plunge the city into darkness and eventually lead to the Laverack riddle being solved. Back in 2005, I was the detective superintendent in charge of Humberside Police's major investigation team. And our role was to deal with, you know, as the title suggests, any major investigations which uh, came in, into Humberside. So that would be any murders, any missing person investigations which had some uh, potentially suspicious context to those, or any armed robberies, anything of that ilk, kidnappings and that, that type of thing would fall within the remit of the major investigation team. And certainly at that time, um, we were experiencing quite a high volume of uh, murder investigations. In Ray's first two years on the job, there were several murders committed in the city. But there was one call that particularly stood out. And that was on Valentine's Day in 2005. Hello there. Um, we have uh, John here. I, I, I don't know what she is. I just want to report something missing. What's the name, it's uh, John Nelson, John G. Nelson. Well, I've lived in this area for around 40 years now. Uh, I was in, in the police for just over 30 years and retired in August 2013. It holds quite a vibrant, vibrant city. It's the city of culture this year. It's had its share of problems in the past, Hull. 
the fishing communities uh, dissipated some, some years ago and it's taken some time really for the city to, to re recover from that. And uh, there are some uh, pockets of deprivation in the city, but generally there's a really good community spirit. Hull's a city with a, a great history and some would say a great future, but uh, it'd be fair to say that the present hasn't been entirely kind. Hull has a, a dark past, as, as any port city does, and without doubt some of the estates have had their, their fair share of, of, of crime. But like every town or city, behind the curtains and under the cover of darkness, killers can blend into the community. In February 2005, the city of Hull was in an apparently romantic mood as loving couples enjoyed Valentine's Day. Oh, the restaurants were packed and red roses were in full supply. But just a mile from the center in the west of the city, there was a very different atmosphere. Hello there. Um, I've been uh, filmed here. I, I, I don't know where she is. I just want to report somebody missing. What's her name, please? It's uh, John Nelson. John Jean Nelson. I'm assuming she's been to work in that, but it's just that the cars parked further up the road and the doors are unlocked. It's, I've been trying to get hold of her on the phone since I've got in. There's no answer. Nobody seems to know I'm aware of her. Is there any arguments or anything, or should you be No, there's or? nothing like that. I mean, um, it's just completely out of character for her. Someone knocked on the door one morning and uh, early in the morning, maybe eight, nine o'clock ish. My husband opened the door and it was Paul Dyson and I think Joanne's father. And Paul was in tears, seemed distraught to say that Joanne had gone missing and wondered if we'd seen her. Joanne lived in the west of the city but worked in the centre. Now her fiance feared she could be anywhere. They believed she'd gone to work that particular morning. Uh, when he left her, she was getting ready to go to work. He'd gone off to work himself. And when he returned home, he'd expected to find her there already. Um, but she wasn't there. He'd run around her, her friends, and uh, none of the friends had seen her. Mum and Dad were frantic. Um, it was highly unusual that Joanne would go missing, and she would always ring, ring her mum on a daily basis. That call hadn't been forthcoming. Um, and finding her nowhere, decided that late that evening he would, he would ring the police and report her missing. Joanne Nelson was 22 years old. She lived with her fiancé, Paul, and as far as anyone could tell, was a perfectly normal member of the whole community. Joanne was a very petite, blonde, pretty young woman. I think quite shy, really. Um, Paul was different, quite outgoing, uh, well-built. Paul seemed to be really devoted to Joanne and conversations I had with him, cared a lot about her. And they just seemed a very nice, happy couple. It had seemed to be a fairly romantic relationship. Uh, they'd been looking forward to getting married in the future. Uh, they'd saved up and they'd, they'd bought a house. And things appeared to be, you know, certainly to an outsider looking in, like a normal, uh, fairly healthy relationship. Now Paul Dyson was becoming emotional, desperate to find his fiance and understand why she'd vanished. I don't know where she is. I want her back. Lots of people do go missing every year. Around 210,000 people in the country go missing. People go missing because they've got problems around finance, uh, relationships. Is there anything obvious that we can follow up very quickly to try and establish where they might be? Is it possible the car's broken down or they've uh, met up with an old friend, telephone's died and you know they're still out? And it's just really asking those questions, the 101 questions that a police officer would ask in those circumstances. Why? majority of those people do turn up safe and well, but occasionally some of those will uh, turn into a uh, substantial 
investigation or even in the worst case scenario, a murder investigation. But where do you look in a city the size of Hull? Every police officer was on alert and search teams began to scour the likely locations, methodically checking transport links, possible sightings, and any place that Joanne might be connected to. But wherever they searched, the police were drawing a blank. If somebody goes missing and it's the first time, and it's highly unusual, those things alone start to ring some alarm bells and you do start to express some, some concern. This is so out of character. You know, it's perhaps more and more unlikely that that person would have gone missing of their own accord. And it may have been that some, something uh, sinister has befallen them. It wouldn't be unheard of for a killer to strike in the city of Hull. In the 1970s, a notorious killer called Bruce Lee terrorized the town with a series of arson attacks. He killed up to 15 in dozens of targeted fires, pursuing his dream of becoming the UK's biggest serial killer. And in 2015, jealous Deland Alman murdered his fiancée in a hotel in Ferensway, close to the city centre, after years of domestic violence. And in 2005, Joanne Nelson was headed for the same part of town on her way to work, but she never arrived. Now, detectives are piecing together her last movements to find out whether she'd come to any harm. Paul Dyson had given us an account uh, which included that uh, Joanne's car was still there, parked in the street, that her telephone had gone missing, that her keys had gone missing, and that her work clothes, the things she would normally work, wear for the office, uh, were also missing. So in the early stages, we need to rely on Dyson's account, because that was all we had. They had lived together. Uh, there was no one else living, living at the house. And so whatever Dyson said, uh, we had to take on board and see whether or not that held water. We've got investigation opportunities around her telephone. Who was the last person called? What was the nature of that conversation? Is there any telephone usage lately? You know, is there any way of potentially tracking that telephone now? In this particular case, Joanne's telephone hadn't been used at all since the time she was reported missing. There were inquiries made along the route. What, you know, what route would she normally take? Well, she would normally go to work in a car. But on this occasion, her car was there, parked outside the house at the front, and it was, un it was unlocked, which was, again, highly, highly unusual. The police have their job to do, it's their job to investigate and to try and uh, find out what on earth happened. Um, the press has a very different job. It's our job to keep this in the public eye and to find out everything that we can uh, and in no way hinder the police in what they're doing. But it became my job to play the local card, to go and knock on doors and ask people, what do you know about Joanne? What do you know about her family? What can you tell me that can help me help the police? Instinct and experience tells you that the partner is always the first person that the police suspect and it's without a doubt the first person that the journalist covering the case suspects. The interior of the house, when the, when the police went there, there was no signs of a struggle, nothing particularly obvious in, in there at all. The two Valentine's cards were on the, on the fireplace and there was nothing particularly around the house that, that stood out as though there may be some issues. As soon as I uh, was told that uh, Joanne was, was missing, I made it my business to find out everything that I could about, about her and, and, more importantly, about him. Uh, and I, I spoke to a, a, lot of, a lot of work colleagues, a lot of people who'd worked with him when he was a bouncer. Uh, it became quite clear that, uh, that, that this was somebody who had uh, temper problems. Paul Dyson had been to work at the local timber yard on the day Joanne disappeared. And he'd visited the gym on his way home. But there was one trip the day before Joanne vanished which caught the attention of police. And it was captured on CCTV. It was late evening and I took a telephone call from uh, a colleague, another officer who was working on the inquiry. 
who explained to me that uh, there was now some CCTV of Paul Dyson on the Sunday morning, Sunday the 13th of February, uh, going to a local grocer's shop. The local shop owner rang into the police station to explain that Dyson had been in the, in the, in the store and had bought some bin bags and cleaning materials. And she now saw that as being really relevant, given the fact that John, John was missing. So Dyson is buying cleaning products and bin bags on February the 13th. It's not exactly a romantic pre-Valentine's Day shopping trip, but it's not an unusual thing to do either. Police may have been questioning what was going on, but it didn't amount to any evidence of foul play. Monday morning, um, because I couldn't get Valentine's Day off, um, we, we swapped cards upstairs. <laughs> I gave her a kiss and a cuddle, got ready for wear. She was going to get her head down for another hour or so. What does Joanne mean to you? She's the only person I truly love. <laughs> I don't know where she is. I want her back. I was very tearful, upset. Um, and crying, saying, I just, I just want her back, I just want her back. Obviously, Paul looked distressed. He was crying, and you feel for him that he's going through a terrible time not knowing where Johan was. It was now three days since Joanne had vanished, and the police were no nearer to finding her. The city of Hull was beginning to lose hope that she'd ever be found. In February 2005, the city of Hull was consumed by the search for a local woman, Joanne Nelson. She'd failed to turn up to work on Valentine's Day and had not been seen or heard from since. Three days into the search, her fiancé Paul made an emotional appeal for information. Monday morning, um, because I couldn't get Valentine's Day off, um, we we swapped cards upstairs. <laughs> Police weren't aware that Paul was going to do uh, an interview to, uh, to the news cameras at all. And the first I was aware of that was when it was shown on, on TV. What does Joanne mean to you? She's the only person I truly love. <laughs> I don't know where she is. I want her back. Lots of people, when they view a media appeal like that, and it involves somebody very close to the victim, will form a, a view fairly quickly as to whether or not that person's telling the truth. Some people can be way, way more convincing than others, of course. But I have to say, in that case, when I saw Dyson um, doing his appeal to cameras, I just didn't believe him. Looking back now, when the appeal was on the television, you sort of get the sense that maybe it's false tears. They do say that crocodile tears are easy to see through. He didn't even manage to squeeze out any tears. Every single person in that room knew he hung himself with that performance. Dyson was very visibly upset. He was crying, and the camera crew focused in on Dyson's hands. And you could see from there that on the back of his thumb, uh, there were two scratches, semicircular shaped scratches to the back of his thumb. And I'd been aware from dealing with previous murder cases uh, involving strangulation that the victim will often try to remove the offender's hands from uh, the throat by pulling those hands away. And seeing those scratches on the back of his hands uh, made me think that he could potentially have been involved in doing something uh, potentially violent to, to Joanne. 
the things that, that had cropped up was the fact that he'd been married previously. During the course of that relationship and on the wedding night, he had actually uh, hit his wife and knocked her unconscious. And following that, there were a number of occasions when he would, uh, he used to call it, sleep her out. So he'd put her in a, uh, a neck lock and squeeze until such time as she passed out. And of course, he would think that was quite, that was quite funny. But clearly, that relationship deteriorated quite rapidly and uh, the marriage didn't last. Dyson had been raised in Hull, and while most children in the city had a routine upbringing, his home life had been a more challenging environment. Remarkably, Paul Dyson's own father was a killer. Paul Dyson's father had been involved in two incidents where, where people had, uh, had died. Uh, one of which was a violent fight, and he'd actually uh, stabbed that person to death. He ended up being sentenced to a fairly lengthy term of imprisonment for that, that stabbing. And he was involved in another incident where um, he was involved in a fatal accident in a, in a car. But now it was Paul who'd caught the attention of police. CCTV had captured him buying cleaning products and bin bags around the time Joanne had disappeared and cops were learning his behavior had become erratic and he'd been asking some very unusual questions. The more we found out about, about Paul Dyson and his background and his potentially uh, violent, violent past, the less he appeared to be like the victim. Things just didn't add up, things just didn't appear to be as he was portraying them. We'd been aware that he'd been visiting um, other associates, some of which were criminal associates and we were interested in finding out just what it was that he'd been speaking to those about. He's been asking people, you know, is it possible to get DNA from, from skin? How long do fingerprints last out in the open? Those type of things, which were all, of course, highly, highly suspicious. Paul's mum came into the station whilst he was being interviewed, and she told us that she had some information that might assist the, the investigation. Paul Dyson, had confided in a close friend of his that he'd carried out the, the murder of Joanne. Paul Dyson was arrested and questioned in the city police station, and it didn't take long for his account of the truth to emerge. By the Sunday, he admits that he's killed Joanne during the course of an argument in the, in the house, and that he's disposed of Joanne's body somewhere out in the rural area. He'd taken Joanne out in the car and he'd wrapped her body in bin bags. And those were the bin bags which he'd bought earlier from the shop. He'd driven and driven, he said he was crying, he was upset, and he'd just driven and driven as far as he reasonably could until he found a spot which was really isolated. He said there was a gate, and he remembered this gate very clearly. There was a pile of broken bottles down to the right side of this, this gate. And the gate was unusual because um, you couldn't open it inwards because the land rose very quickly behind the gate. You could only open it outwards. Despite his grim confession, Dyson claimed he didn't know where the gate actually was, but police needed to find it. We put him in a police car and we take him out and we drive him past all the sites he can remember seeing, hopefully to lead us to the body. On the first occasion, that, that fails. He can't remember exactly where the body was. And we begin to take him out on time after time after time to try and get him to take us to where, where he said he's left Joanne's body. And we drove for hundreds, maybe thousands of miles. But at that point, we realised, well, this man either can't or won't take us to where um, he said he's left Joanne's body. And we had to rely on volunteers. We had uh, international rescue people. We had volunteer uh, cadaver dogs. Helicopters, the RAF were helping us because obviously, you know, we were desperate to recover Joanne's body for, for her parents. What our main purpose is is to search and find someone hopefully alive and give the friends and family a a good news at the end of the day. This search was slightly different, that we knew we were searching for 
someone that had already been killed, but you're still wanting to find that person, you're still wanting to, to do that for the family. Basically, we were getting out at every gatepost, every forest track and uh, searching that. The dogs were key to searching the really difficult areas of ground that were quite dense for people to, to get through. Basically, you're, you're out there until either the police call off the search or the weather gets so bad that you've got to call off the search, you know, so we knew that we'd be out there all day. But three days of searches draw a blank. Ray had his confession. Without a body, the case was still far from solved. You've got to wonder, was he telling us the truth at that time? Is some of his story right? Is the whole of the story right? Determined to find Joanne, Ray was prepared to listen to anyone who he thought could help. And after exploring all possible leads, he called on Pat, a specialist in forensic ecology. One of the important aspects is finding where people have been, linking, trying to link objects with places. It's quite easy, if you have enough trace evidence, to envisage the place. Each part of our countryside contains its own unique combination of flora and fauna. Different pollens from the trees and plants can give each region its own ecological DNA. And much like other types of evidence, that DNA can be traced with the help of forensic experts. Whilst the searches were taking place, the, the forensic examinations were continuing and we'd sent some mud um, from the pedals of John's car and from the front spoiler of the car off for examination. We've got pine and we've got western hemlock. This narrowed it all down. The police could then home in and find out where he western hemlock was being grown. Some of those pollens were rarer than, than others, and some would not normally grow this far, this far north. So the challenge really for us at that point was to say, well, look, we know what pollens are in there, within that soil, um, and we could really do to know where all those pollens grow together. Then I had heather pollen. Now this tells me immediately, it's not closed woodland, this is, this is an open area. So this person has walked in the open to get near a, a woodland edge, really. And I was able to give the police this sort of picture, telling them what to expect to find. I went with a colleague and decided to drive around the area and see whether or not we could see any gates that fitted the description of the one we were particularly looking for. We walked through the woods, myself and my colleague. We split up in the woods. He walked off to the right and I carried on walking straight through the centre of the woods for around three or four hundred metres. We descended into a, a dip, which was quite a dark, steep dip. I noticed a pile of branches in the hollow at the, the bottom of the dip. And looking closely at it, I could see that there was a body um, in bin bags um, placed in the dip under a big pile of uh, branches there. This search uh, turned out to be the biggest search operation ever carried out by Humberside Police. It involved hundreds of officers, hundreds of volunteers, and really covered about 2,000 miles into three different counties. On a personal level, it's, it's a relief. You know, I'd been leading the inquiry by that stage for 39 days, and there was huge and mounting pressure, both internally within the organisation and through the media, to try and find her. But the most important thing was Joanne's parents. They were desperate to have their daughter back. <laughs> 
and knowing that we found her meant that we could go some way towards reinstating Joanne's body with mum and dad, which is what they were desperate for. Dyson was determined to get, to get away with this murder. There's no, there's no question about that. He'd made the telephone call to police in front of Joanne's parents and he'd convinced them that she was missing. He knew nothing about it. And he'd gone on uh, the local news media and made a tearful appeal to camera. You know, he was desperate to portray himself as a grieving, worried victim. There's no question, he, he, he was going to play the long game in this. And he was determined at the outset to try and make sure that he got away with murder. Paul Dyson was charged with Joanne's murder. He pleaded guilty and was given a life sentence behind bars. I think most people in the city will remember, remember this case because Joanne was young, she had everything to live for, she came from such a loving family, she had a huge circle of friends and she was killed by a partner and that was linked to, to Valentine's Day. And the scale of the search operation subsequently, I think sort of burnt that in, in everybody's mind locally. There's no world in which he and Joanne should have been anywhere near each other. She was a, a kind, sweet girl um, who just somehow was manipulated by this appalling specimen of a man. Come Valentine's Day, I always remember her, and it's a few years now, but no, I don't think I will forget it. But far from the end of the story, Ray and his team decided they could do more. At the end of the John Nelson case, we realised the help that Pat Wiltshire could give to major incidents. And we decided that it perhaps would be worth um, just applying that science uh, that, that Pat was able to, to utilise to see if that could take our investigations any further. One case that still lingered over the city was the murder of nine-year-old Christopher Laverack. He had been killed after what seemed to be a bungled burglary and his body found by a remote waterway. Five suspects were on the police list, including known sex offenders and people that the cops couldn't rule out. Now Pat was being asked to provide the help. She was quickly deployed to reinvestigate the facts. This was an incredibly complicated case that had been going on a very long time. They had, I think, four or five suspects, but they weren't sure which one had done it. But could Zion strike twice and solve the biggest murder unsolved in Hull's history? In 2005, the city of Hull was reeling from the news that local girl Joanne Nelson had been killed by her fiancé. But while that case was now solved, Another murder still hung over the city. Nine-year-old Christopher Laverack had apparently been abducted from the home of his aunt in 1984. His body had been found in a carpet bag two days later. But although there were several suspects, no killer had ever been found. It was in the days when our sort of work had never been done and they couldn't find any evidence to show that someone had been involved in killing him. And what they wanted to do was to compare the little boy's clothing with the gardens from their suspects. And I analysed all the things they gave me from all the gardens and so on, one of which was a stone that had come out of a water feature and had soil on it. This stone from this water feature was very similar to the little boy's clothing, the profile I got from his clothing. And I was able to say that this little boy had been on his knees and his front in a place that had the same pollen input as this stone. Science could place Christopher near a water feature shortly before his death, but Pat wasn't finished. And I also said to the police, well, I think he has been where someone was keeping chickens. Why? 
well, there's all this cereal pollen and it doesn't fit a, the, the garden. It doesn't, doesn't fit. I said, when you think about it, you would still get cereal pollen on straw or hay. So they went to neighbours and said, did, they, did this person used to keep chickens? And they said, no, but he used to keep ducks. The one suspect who had a water feature and who kept ducks was Melvin Reed, Christopher Laverack's uncle. He was a known prolific abuser of children. Uh, he'd been convicted following arrest in 2001 and had served a seven and a half year sentence um, for abuse of uh, young boys around the time that Christopher Laverack was murdered. We knew that he had knowledge of the, the Beverly Beck area where Christopher's body was disposed of because he previously worked there build, building caravans. We knew that on the night he'd been in the same pub as Christopher's other uncle and, and auntie and would have seen them in there and probably been aware that Christopher was on his own. He owned a car which was very similar to the type of the car uh, which had been seen by witnesses to pull up outside Christopher's house. With Pat Wilcher's evidence, uh, we were able to show that there was that definitive link between Melvin Reed's property and Christopher Laverack's clothing. But Melvin Reed couldn't be charged because he was dead. He died in prison some years earlier while serving another sentence for abuse. When a kid is abducted, sexually assaulted, killed and dumped in a river. That's not something that a city can just brush over. That demands justice. Uh, so it, it, it always seemed as though that was a, a before and after moment in Hull's history. This was a really significant case. It was very much in the mindset of people in, in Hull and was very important, at least to Christopher's, to Christopher's mum, of course, to find out exactly what had happened to, uh, to, to her son and numerous police officers had worked on this for, for a very long time. So it was a matter of some relief that we felt we were in a situation where we now had sufficient um, circumstantial evidence and that critical forensic evidence which bound everything together. And were Melvin Reed still alive, it's highly likely that he would have been convicted for this case. So while they couldn't see justice done, the city at least now had answers. And in the space of one investigation into a missing woman, cops had now solved two violent murders, thanks in part to Pat Wilshire. I got a letter from Joanne's mother um, thanking me for finding her daughter. And it's heartbreaking, really. And what could I say? I mean, I wrote back and said, I'm just glad I was able to help. It made me realize we had made a difference. The Christopher Laverack case had remained unsolved for, for 28 years, and now finally, um, Pat Wilcher's evidence was able to give us that final piece in the jigsaw to prove that Melvin Reed was undoubtedly the person responsible for the gruesome murder of Christopher Laverack. The two murders were now solved, and the city could breathe easier. But unfortunately, in a murder town, you never know when the next killer might strike.